Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Keiko. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Keiko. Hi, Keiko. Um, thank you to this group for just being here. Um, thank you to everyone in this room. Um, I'm really grateful for this program. I got sober on March 2nd, 2014. I got sober, I was 36, and it really just felt like, um, like grace. Like I, there was a window, there was an opening, and I just jumped through it because at that point, it just was like, um, I had, uh, I had had, I had known that I was an alcoholic, like probably about, um, seven years prior, I was in LA, um, passed out on the side of the road in my car. And I kind of like came to and was like, I need to stop this. I'm an alcoholic. So I had that thought in my mind, but I kept going. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here today and sober and a woman of grace and dignity because of this program. Um, so a little bit about me, I grew up in Hawaii and I felt really uncomfortable there and, um, different, all of that, you know, it was, you name it, I felt it, I had it. Um, I was kind of like addicted to, other things, at least my, my, uh, alcoholism showed up in other areas before it actually came out in, with alcohol as my solution. Um, and I grew up in a family that where we have a lot of alcoholism in the family. So I was around it. I, um, growing up, I just, it was uncomfortable because I just didn't like it as a young child. I felt really like, um, it was chaotic. My, the, my family members, it was chaotic. It was loud. It, it felt, um, just like it made me want to retreat. And so that's what I did as a young person. I just isolated all the time. Um, and then about seventh grade, that's when I had my first drink of alcohol. And it was very much like how I like to drink, which is alone, desperately thinking that I'm connecting with you, like completely alone, wanting to be a part of. And that's like, that kind of describes like my whole journey with alcohol is that I, um, you know, I, once I left Hawaii, I moved to Seattle and, um, I was there for 14 years and I, um, I just, honestly, once I hit Seattle, I was blackout drunk all the time. Like that's how I drank. I just hit it hard. Um, I actually became like my family members that, that I felt really uncomfortable, you know, um, or I felt like I wasn't like them, but in reality, I was just like them. I partied hard. Um, and so I, yeah, I was a blackout drinker from the start. And then I, that's like 14 years in Seattle, took me to LA for a couple of years, just progressed, you know, um, but I kept going after having that thought in the car. I actually, my parents moved me home to Hawaii. Um, and I was a dry drunk for like a year. And in that year, like I tried, I did a lot of Bikram yoga. I had some diet changes. I was trying to get healthy on my own and I was so miserable. Um, because I didn't have these steps. And, uh, so anyways, I ended up running to New York because I couldn't live in Hawaii. I was so unhappy and, um, I got to New York and that's where I bottomed out. And, um, New York's really, it was like perfect for me because I 
I would bar hop by myself all the time. Like I would just go and like start in the morning, think I'm going like walking around the city, hanging out, exploring. All I was doing was bar hopping. (laughs) Um, So that was, that was basically it. And what happened was again, I was wanting to connect desperately. Um, Things of course started to get dangerous. Like, as it always does for us. Um, Really just putting myself in places that like whenever I'd wake up, I would feel like ashamed and demoralized and um, just like, really like, why, why am I doing this? Um, So that was like my last night. It was just desperately wanting to connect with someone I thought was, this gal that I just wanted to be her friend. I thought she was so cool. And I've been in New York at that point for, I think like three years. So, and I still felt this desire, like to, to just whatever be alone all the time. And yet like have a community, like totally, you know, extreme feelings of extreme opposite feelings of, um, loneliness and desperation. And then, um, yeah, wanting that, that connection with others. Um, so, so I, I ended up having like a night, a normal night for me. And then I, um, woke up the next morning and for some reason I was just like, I just, yeah, there was that window and I, I jumped through and, um, what happened was I, my roommate at the time, one of my roommates, I went down to her room. I really didn't know her that well. Thank you. I knocked on her door and I just said, I need to tell you something. I'm going to stop drinking. Like I have a problem. I'm going to stop drinking. And she was kind of like, okay. (laughs) She didn't really know what to think, but for me, it was actually a very big deal because I'd never voiced this to anyone before. Um, I surrounded myself with people who like to drink like me. So, and then what, and then I was actually alone a lot of the time drinking alone. So people didn't in my life didn't know I had this, um, this problem. And so I, you know, decided to get sober, but of course I decided to do it alone again. It was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this thing, but I, I didn't really know where to go. I didn't know how to reach out, but thankfully another higher power moment. I had a friend in New York who I knew from Seattle and she, we actually lived together in New York. So she saw part of my bottom and she was like, I know someone who is sober. You should, you should hang out with her. And she gave me her number and, um, and I met this gal. We, we went to the museum. We did like a normal friend date. And then she asked me to tell her her story. And, and that was like the first time I had ever shared any of this with another alcoholic. And it just really changed things from that point on, I still, she told me about AA. I kind of was like, um, I'm gonna, I felt open to it. So I thought, why not? But it took me a while. It took me about six, seven months to come in and fully commit. And what happened again was I was just so alone. So I was an emotional bottom at this point. Um, I just, I just really needed to find people that I could have a community with and and share this experience with. And so I came to AA. I, um, it took me then another three months to get a sponsor because, you know, that, that was hard. Um, but I did. And then I started to work the steps and the steps. Um, I've been through all 12 steps. I, um, I love this woman who sponsored me in New York. I love her. She's, um, I've also had an interim sponsor in the, at the time, uh, she was traveling in Asia. So I've worked with other women. I have a sponsor here now who I'm so grateful for. Um, and I have sponsees. I have sponsored people in New York. 
men and women, and I've sponsored, I sponsor women out here now. And, um, you know, like my journey so far, I'm just, there are so many things I could say about sobriety, but the biggest one is that I'm learning life on life's terms. And that is like, uh, that is a huge gift in itself because before, like the way I viewed life and the way I viewed myself in life was that it should always work for me. If it's not working for me, then I don't like it. Like it was very much like um, a self-centered uh, perspective. That's my time. <laughs> it was a self-centered perspective. Um, definitely just... I, you know, I just had a hard time really um, believing that anything good could ever happen to me, for me, be given to me. It was always like how, um, there was this, this part of me that felt like I had to I had to look out for myself. I had to take care of myself. I couldn't connect with others. I was worthless anyways, you know. So, so to come into these rooms and learn, like, it's not about me it's actually life on life's terms and I get to just be here and like experience it. That was like a, a huge thing. I'm still learning that every day. And, um, that's really all I have to say. I'm looking forward to hearing your 40 minute speaker. So thank you. My name is Jay and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jay. 40 minutes seems like a long time. So we'll see how it goes. Thanks, Keiko, for sharing your story. That was interesting. Um, so, yeah, my name's Jan. I'm an alcoholic. What does that mean? Well, to me, what that means is, is that I would rather drink than do anything else. And I would rather drink as long and as often as possible. That for some reason, the idea of alcohol seems to be the solution to everything in my life. And that I don't even care what's in my life other than alcohol. Uh, and for a lot of my younger years, all I did was drink and use drugs. So basically, I grew up in San Diego. Um, I actually grew up in Maryland before that till I was in third grade, but then I moved to San Diego. And uh, that was kind of a culture shock. Um, San Diego was a lot different. The uh, the first day at school, I wore a turtleneck and long pants, and everyone else was in a uh, bathing suit and flip-flops. <laughs> so that was a little weird. We also moved to kind of a rural area. It, w it was upscale rural, though, basically. Um, and there weren't any kids, so I didn't really get a lot of opportunity to acclimate to, to the young people in my situation other than being at school, which was kind of difficult for me. Um, and that's ultimately where the first signs of alcoholism probably came about was at school. Even, you know, in kindergarten, first grade, um, I couldn't get along with any of the teachers. I couldn't do I could do the work if you talked to me about it. But if you actually wanted me to write something down and participate and do it on my own and then turn it in, for some reason that didn't seem to work very well. Um, I was argumentative. Um, I was easily distracted. Um, all not good things for uh, trying to be a student. So I would spend a lot of time outside the classroom in trouble or just outside the classroom. So in the end, I wasn't even in trouble. They would just go, Jay, go sit outside the principal's office or whatever. And everyone was so used to it that it wasn't like a punishment. It was just like a mechanism for them to, to kind of get try and get the class back under control. And my parents were super concerned, and they would say stuff like, what's wrong? How can we help you? And I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, to me... You know, it was the teachers, it was the other kids, it was the fact that I had to go to school at all was the problem, and that I was doing fine, and uh, and I didn't understand why they were so concerned. So anyway, um, you know, that was most of elementary school and junior high was spent in some form of 
disappointment to myself and to, and to the teachers and my parents and some form of trouble that I could and that was the other thing I couldn't not do it I couldn't avoid it and I didn't want to first of all but it was so ingrained in who I was and, and how I handled things that you know I was being me I was relaxing I was accepting who I am and just taking you know taking the best I had to offer and trying to apply it to what I'm doing. And it just never worked. So anyway, in elementary school, in, in fourth through sixth grade is where I really came to a head, arguing out, out and out with teachers, using profanity, breaking things, stealing things, causing a lot of trouble. Uh, I had my first drink in sixth grade. Um, interestingly enough, I had no idea what alcohol was, but I heard that my two friends had gone to his dad, his one friend's house and gotten some alcohol and drank it and then, you know, see what happened. And then they went home after that or whatever. And I immediately knew that I had to do it, um, and that it was super important and it's going to be super good. Where I got that from, I have no idea because I had never really thought about alcohol before that, but I was convinced. So it took me a while, but I convinced the same kid whose house they got the alcohol out to let me do it. And we went there, and his older sister was there, and he was there, and one other friend was there. And the idea was is that we were going to take a small sip out of each bottle, and then, and that was it. Probably take about 10 minutes. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. So, unfortunately, the first thing I did was they handed me this bottle of vodka, and I immediately, unfortunately, I was bigger than most kids when I was younger, too, which didn't help. So I stiff-armed this kid, leaned over the sink, and just guzzled as much vodka as I could. Again, where I got that from, I have no idea. I, I, I must admit that I have no prior experience with if you guzzle alcohol, it will work better. <laughs> but that's what happened. And uh, and so obviously after I got done guzzling because I was able to drink a good good deal of that vodka, everyone was really freaked out. Again, here's another situation where I'm like, "What's wrong?" And everyone else is convinced this they're dead. Like as soon as their parents see this much alcohol gone, it's over. So I can try to convince them that it was no big deal and that everything was fine and started getting really drunk and they were super worried and for some reason I was still at the house and they were trying to figure out how to get, you know, get over all this stuff and I made a joke about, you know, the next time the phone rings we should pick it up and say, who the fuck is this? <laughs> Again, why? I have no idea. But their reaction was some somewhat positive. So <laughs> I did it. Right. And that their look on their faces twice now in a row was, this is really bad. And why did you do that? And unfortunately, and later on, I found out that it was one of their parents' friends and that they did get in a lot of trouble. And ultimately, I was on the down low from that that. The, the guy's dad hated me from then on out, and I was pretty good friends with him, but I was blackballed. So anyway, and the, the weird thing also was it was like a Tuesday night, and so I'm skateboarding home, super drunk, don't remember a thing, crashed a couple times, I'm sure. Get home at like 7.30 when I'm supposed to be home at 5.30 before it gets dark, and it was winter time, and... I think my mom came and found me and drove me home, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. But somehow, it was no big deal. Like, no one said anything, you know? So whether I had been acting out so much before that they had given up, or whether or not they just, for some reason, didn't think that the fact that I missed dinner for, like, the first time in forever was, was any big deal. So anyway, the next morning, I was super hungover. By this time, I'm pretty sure my mom knew. Um... It was, again, I had to go to school and everything, so that was kind of ugly. But, you know, it didn't seem to be a bad thing. It didn't, nothing, you know, I didn't want to do it right away afterwards, but, but I didn't think anything wrong with about it. Um, 
I had some explaining to do to my friends, obviously. They weren't going to let me drink their alcohol anymore. <laughs> but ultimately, that was the first incident with alcohol. And there was from that situation where there was probably five or six things that should have indicated that this was not a good idea, I, I did not take that as, as viable information. And probably a couple of years, probably took me a couple of years before I started drinking regularly. And I was also introduced to drugs fairly early, probably around 14. A friend of mine's older sister's boyfriend was the drug dealer in town. So he thought it was funny to get his girlfriend's younger brother high, mostly with coke, while they would watch football games for some reason. Well, I hated football, but I decided that I would try and work my way into the rotation of this deal and try cocaine. Which I did, and again, it seemed like a really good idea, seemed like a really good thing. Didn't get any trouble at this point, but definitely wanted more than they were willing to give me. <laughs> and, you know, again, for some reason, it just seemed like the thing to do. Like, none of these things seemed bad. None of them seemed outlandish. It just seemed like if I had a choice of doing anything on that day, it was going to be that without any previous examples or any previous experience. And I thought about it a lot. Um, I l was lucky enough to grow up in a place called La Jolla, California, which is beautiful. Um, I lived above this surfing beach that had these 300-foot cliffs, so we got to kind of live on the cliffs and surf every day. Um, uh, for some reason, I loved it, but I complained constantly that it was sucked and that it was a ripoff and that <laughs> for some reason the waves weren't good enough or, you know, I had to go to school or something. I was bored. So that was another thing that came along with alcoholism was the fact that I complained constantly, was never happy, was constantly argumentative and just a real pain in the ass, I'm pretty sure. And unfortunately wanted everyone to be my friend, which is kind of counterproductive because if you're being everything that's antisocial or anti-friend, and you're wondering why nobody wants to be your friend, obviously you're not getting the whole picture. So I did have a few friends, and uh, I did hang out with them a lot, and they kind of accepted who I was. And most of them had tried drugs and drank, and they could do it just a little, and I'd have to do it a lot. Um, we tried growing pot. We kept getting ripped off. I figured out, okay, so if we're getting ripped off, I'm going to start ripping off everybody else, too, because that seems to be the way to do it, rather than try and grow it. So, and another thing I should get back to is that in elementary school, for some reason, and the story is, is that in, like, second or third grade, a couple of people figured out that if you called or sent letters to, to different distributorships like Coca-Cola, 7-Up, different things like that, they would send you these promotional stickers and beer companies and different things like that. So they started collecting these stickers, two or three of my friends did. And, you know, they got 10 or 15 different stickers, and they would all show them to each other and get all excited, and I really liked it. But the idea of writing letters or calling companies just seemed really lame, and I didn't want to do that. So one day at elementary, at a, at a recess, I figured since the lockers weren't locked, I would go steal their stickers, and then I would have them, and that would be good. Well, again, bad idea. Now I had all the stickers, but I couldn't tell anyone. <laughs> and that seemed to be what I really wanted to do, was have the stickers and show everybody so that I would look cool, or whatever. So that was a real problem, because then I realized that now I have the stickers, they're really bombed. Nobody, no, we can't play sticker game anymore, or whatever you want to call it. So I then tried to hide them in a place where I would find them to save them for the other kids. So, that I would be the hero. so I threw them down this light well that was like two stories, and it was this little white triangle that was actually his manila envelope. And I would point it out to my friends I think those are the stickers, I think those are stickers, and they'd be like, No, those aren't the stickers, whatever. So anyway, this whole plan became a failure. But that started my uh, career of stealing. For whatever reason, stealing seemed like the answer as well. And I don't know whether I got excited about stealing or whether it was just super easy. 
probably easy because it didn't. It didn't ex- I, like. I didn't get all stoked on stealing. I just wanted stuff that I didn't want to pay for or, or work for. And if I stole it, I could get it, and it was quick and easy. So it was convenience. So anyway, that's not a good thing either, and that became a huge problem, along with drugs and alcohol. So anyway, like I said, we're surfing every day, skateboarding, surfing really good waves, really big waves, got really into it, skateboarding, pretty high-level skateboarding. We used to go down this one hill, which was huge, and we'd go like 50, and we decided that if we hung on to my friend's van and started going like 30 before we let go and then sat down on the skateboard, we could go... Uh, 67 was the fastest I ever went. And again, this all seemed like a great idea, you know, super fun, loved to do it. Had no idea that we were probably risking our lives. Same with surfing. The bigger the waves, the better. A lot of other guys that wouldn't go out, we'd go out anyway. You know, surf. You just do it. I mean, just no, no idea, no real cluing in to the fact that, A, this is dangerous, or B, maybe not the best idea. So anyway, I wanted to read something. So this is kind of in a nutshell what I just tried to explain, and it's the keys to the kingdom. And there's some time definitions here that don't apply to me, but I'm going to read them in there anyway because it's in the book. Keys to the Kingdom. A little more than 15 years ago, through a long and calamitous series of shattering experiences, I found myself being helplessly propelled towards total destruction. I was without the power to change the course my life had taken. How I had arrived at this tragic impasse, I could not have explained to anyone. I was 33 years old and my life was spent. I was caught in a cycle of alcohol and sedation that was proving inescapable and consciousness had become intolerable. That's it. I mean, if this wasn't a 40-minute share, I'd read that and move on. (laughs) Because that's exactly what happened. Um, I should share this, too, for whatever reason. I don't usually share this because it's kind of no big deal to me, but it's a big deal to everybody else. My sobriety date is March 10th, 1985. I'm 51 years, or 53 years old, and I got sober in San Diego, like I said. But anyway, so this means I've been sober for well over half my life, which is a pretty big deal. Um, If you've done that, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but it is. I mean, mostly because it's just time. Like, I guess the best way to put it is, is that if you were me, and you got out of got out of what being sober what I got out of you would stay sober and once you stayed sober and 53 years went by or not 53 33 years went by you would then understand that you know this was a good thing to do and it was easy meaning that it was easy to go to meetings it was easy to work the steps it was easy to have a sponsor it was easy to make friends in AA which most of my friends are sober but what happened, what I was dealing with on that, a lot of things weren't easy. So life wasn't easy, but being an AA was easy. So anyway, back to my drug addiction. So again, 14 years old, I'm doing cocaine for the first time. I'm trying pot for the first time. We're trying to grow pot. It's not being very profitable, so we start stealing pot. A lot of the friends in my neighborhood are very well off, well funded. So... We're citing that, you know, doing drugs every day is a good thing. Drinking every day is a good thing if we can. And a lot of the parents aren't really paying attention, so that makes it pretty easy as well. So that started, and right about this time, I'm not in eighth grade at this point, I decided that ditching school would be a good thing. So I ditched one day with my friend, and it was fun. So within two months, I dropped out of school. So... Again, for some reason, my parents, whether they were fully paying attention or whether they had just given up, I don't know, but they kind of knew eventually with the teachers and everybody, you know, telling them and the vice principal. 
calling them. So for the rest of eighth grade, I was in and out of school, very little in, very a lot out. And by ninth grade, I never went back, uh, mostly so that I could drink and do drugs every day, which, again, seemed like a great idea. It really seemed like the solution. It, it made sense to me. I guess that's the best way to put all of the stuff I did. It just made sense to me, like nothing else did. Going to school didn't make sense to me. Doing homework didn't make sense to me. Following the rules of, ha of my mom's house didn't make sense to me. Doing chores in order to get allowances didn't make sense to me. Stealing everything in sight in order to get what I wanted made tons of sense to me. Doing drugs and drinking at any, co at any cost whatsoever made plenty of sense to me. And it was available, you know. Eventually we started stealing alcohol out of stores. And stealing bikes and selling them and buying pot and, you know, I mean, it was pretty easy to stay loaded every day. So unfortunately with that, with the uh, aspect of stealing came the big consequence, which was eventually the police found out that I was stealing and they weren't very happy about it. <laughs> and other people too. I mean, I stole from people that I knew a lot, you know, and so that wasn't a good thing either. Um, but eventually, like I said, the police, you know, I started getting warrants. I started getting tickets for, like, trespassing and, you know, different things like that. Again, at this point, I had not only dropped out of school, but I had a quote-unquote run away from home, which means I went to a party and never went back. <laughs> so, you know, I'm about 16, 17 Punk rock was a big part of the deal, so I was bald and had steel toe boots. And the punk rock lifestyle was kind of perfect because it meant that I could do whatever I wanted and I, I didn't have a home. You know, if I was homeless and bald, that was punk rock. That's, that's what living like punk rock was. So anyway, and it was, by now it's Mission, Mission Beach, California, which is just below San Diego, or La Jolla, which is great because it's like a war, we used to call it the war zone because it's where everyone gets high and all the derelicts hang out and the pizza beach and there's all kinds of drugs and alcohol. So anyway, being homeless in Mission Beach wasn't so bad. You know, it doesn't get too cold at night. We used to break into boats and sleep in the boats. Uh, eventually I had a car, we used to sleep in my car, different things like that. And as long as we were on this journey of getting high every day and trying to maintain... And, and another thing was, was interesting is that I was the reason I didn't go home also is because I was scared to death I would miss out on something. <laughs> there was this big fear that if I wasn't there all the time, that something would happen that I would miss. And I didn't want to miss it. Like I didn't, I just, I had to be there. And so not going home um, allowed that to happen. I was there. I was, I was one of the only ones that was there constantly. Obviously, at this point, I had met two or three other kids that had run away from their houses, too, and, and we all kind of lived as this pack of degenerates who, and we would call it partying, we partied all the time, which meant that we drank and used drugs and sat around and stared at each other <laughs> as part of the party. So anyway, at around 18, I started going to jail, which wasn't good. But in a way, it was. Um, and eventually, the first couple of times I went to jail kind of shocked me. But after that, it was just part of the deal. I would get a bunch of warrants. I would get sick of being homeless. I would be at a party. The cops would come. I'd refuse to leave. Eventually, they'd arrest me. And then I would go to jail, and I'd have a couple of days off while I got my warrants figured out. And then I'd come out again and start all over again. So that became a pattern after a while is that I would turn myself in by refusing to obey what the police... And the police would tell me, look, we're going to arrest you. All you have to do is leave. If you just walk out the door, we're not going to arrest you. <laughs> and I would swing my skateboard at them or say something inappropriate. And then they go, all right, we're going to arrest you. And boom, there we go. But it, in a way, it was like me volunteering to go to jail because my life was so chaotic that jail made sense. Jail was, or was organized. Jail was predictable. You know, jail, I could sleep all day, which I usually needed to do. So anyway, started going to jail a lot. So eventually the stealing got gotten really bad, meaning I was stealing cars. 
I was breaking into houses. And eventually I got caught and and had a lot of felonies. Basically, actually, I got caught in San Francisco, which was interesting. I came up to San Francisco to get away from everything, and unfortunately, I was on a uh, staying at a friend's house, got locked out, crawled up the fire escape. Again, the guy next door reached out his window and said, if you don't get off the fire escape, I'm calling the cops. So I said, okay, call the cops. I don't care. And once again, I kind of turned myself in, only this time it was really bad. There was like 17 felonies, a lot of which I had done, and my bail was really high, and they were super pissed off. And eventually, I got out. They couldn't prove any of them. It took seven months this time to figure it out. And it was really a little bit of a wake-up call at this point. It was like, wow, that was really not good. And and I was also realizing that I it was my fault at this point is that I was the one who was causing this trouble. So anyway, my dad, luckily, I hadn't talked to him in a while, but he sent me to Santa Barbara to go to school. And although I didn't go to school, I did have limited supply of drugs and alcohol, so I started thinking a little bit. And one of my friends had gone to out, gone to rehab at Olaf House, and he had sent me a letter while I was in jail. And so... A couple of months into living in Santa Barbara with, you know, kind of white knuckling it, I decided to call Ruben at his place and see what it would be like to go up to rehab. So he wasn't there anymore at the, at the, at the Olaf, but they had a number and eventually I got in touch with them. So eventually I got up there. I got super hot. Anyway, I was staying at his house and he asked me not to smoke pot or drink and that's not only did I do that, but I stole money from him to buy the booze and the, and the marijuana. And so he eventually kicked me out. I did get to my intake appointment with Skip. Skip Byron was uh, the intake counselor at that point, and now I guess I named half of the place after him or something, but he was a big part of me getting sober. So at that point, they had this thing where they had to, uh, you had a, they were, you were on a waiting list. And once you were, uh, came down the waiting list to an open bed, they'd call you and you had to be at the bed within 72 hours. So, you know, a month or two after I went back to Santa Barbara, they called me and I got up to, to Olaf and, you know, I did a bunch of drugs on the plane and they told me to be sober for 24 hours. So I sat in the office. They, they let me in, which I wasn't sure they were going to because I was super high. And I just sat in the office waiting to get kicked out. And around 6 o'clock, somebody said, hey, we're closing the office. you got to go sit somewhere else. And I suddenly realized that maybe they weren't going to kick me out. So I went up and went to bed. And my friend Ruben knew I was high, so he was super pissed off. But basically, all of a sudden, I was in rehab. And I didn't drink. And the last time I drank and used drugs was on the airplane going up to Olaf that day, which was March 9th, 1985. So anyway, oh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> this has all been getting high. <laughs> so anyway, I stopped using drugs and alcohol like that. It was just, I didn't really think about it. It was not that big a deal. Um, I still had a lot of behavioral problems. I never lasted an Olaf more than 30 days. On the third 30 days, they asked me not to come back. I didn't. So I went and lived at a residence hotel down in the Tenderloin and got a job. But basically, I started my sober career. And uh, and, I, and I've been sober ever since, you know. I mean, I had no idea what to do. I tried to get sponsors. Early on, sponsors didn't really work. I was asking the wrong people. I was waiting long periods of time between asking the wrong people. So... For the first four or five years, I didn't really have good sponsorship. And I'll tell you one thing about being bad, not, not a good sponsor. At one point, I wanted to do a four-step, and this guy said, no, you don't have to do a four-step. It's no big deal. And I wanted to do it so bad, I did it anyway. And when I went to do my fifth step with him, he took the four-step away from me and said, let's just talk about this. And so if that ever happens to you, that is not a good sponsor. <laughs> you know, the way I sponsor guys today is, is that we read through the – the 12 and 12, one step at a time. We meet for an hour every week. We read through the 12 and 12. We do the steps that have action parts like 
third step prayer, or the third step, we get down on our knees and say the third step prayer. Fourth step, we write an inventory. Fifth step, he shares it with me. Eighth step, we do an inventory, or we do a list, uh, an amends list. Ninth step, we start making amends. Eleventh step, we start praying and finding out who our higher power is. Twelfth step, we start being a service to AA and everyone else. So to me, that's a good sponsor. That's the way to get involved. The reason you have a sponsor is to show you how to get involved with AA, how to interpret things like the book, where to find information, how to get a service commitment, situations where you've never been in before. You can use his experience, his or her experience as a guide, stuff like that. So anyway, I started getting sober, and I worked. I, for a long time, I didn't have good sponsorship, and my life still sucked. I wasn't getting, I wasn't making any progress. I was just staying sober. Um, but eventually, five years into it, I got a really good sponsor. And then I worked the steps the way I told you that I worked the steps with my sponsor. And it worked. You know, the first time I did a four step, it was amazing. Like, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, it made so much more sense than anything else that I had ever done which was kind of the way I rode my life. If it made sense, it was good. And this made so much sense after I did the fifth step. So that was the beginning of my being really sober in AA, and I've done that ever since. Um, you know, that sponsor passed away, and I had to get another sponsor, but luckily there's other people in AA who do the steps the same way I do. So, And there's other people who do the steps differently, which I've also experimented with, which is fine. You know, there's no real way. The only real way to do the steps is the way your sponsor wants you to. And if it's not working for you, get another sponsor and work the steps the way they want you to. But if you have, if you want to use a sponsor, you just got to do what they say. And if you want to work the steps, in my opinion, you got to have a sponsor. So, and and that's the program basically. Is that you know, coming to meetings is super important. It's great. It's having a fellowship around me is super important. Being able to share, being able to be of service, having a regular, you know, meeting schedule, all of that is super helpful. It keeps me calm, keeps me on regular, keeps me, you know, grounded. But without the steps, none of that means anything. You know, it, it gets it becomes stagnant. You know, I still I you know, go back to complaining constantly, go back to being super irritable, go back to fucking bothering everybody around me. And with the steps that doesn't happen. You know, or if it does happen, I realize it and I'm able to stop before it becomes a problem. So anyway, yeah, we're going to do the four step, using the columns. That's the way I do it. Write down who you're upset with. Write down why you're upset, why they're upset with you or why you're upset with them. How it affects me, my resentments towards them. Do a fears list. Do a sexual inventory. All of those things are things that I had never done before but are now part of my life. And that, that process now gave me the life that I have now. My, the life that I had now would not only not be possible, but it would be impossible for me to appreciate it at the level necessary to keep it going. Because I do have to make an effort here. And that's probably one of the best lessons I've learned from AA is that I have to do the work. I have to make the effort. If I don't make the effort, it doesn't work. Nobody can work the steps for me. Nobody can have a service commitment for me. No one can go to meetings for me. It just doesn't work. And believe me, with our sister program, Al-Anon, there's a lot of people out there who would love to do that. <laughs> but it just doesn't work. <laughs> so anyway, another thing I wanted to read, and this is kind of the short version of what I was trying to tell you with all that. Selfishness, self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation, but, they, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it will kill us. God makes that possible, and there is often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self 
without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. That's it. That's what AA does for me, is that I am self-will run riot. I am selfishness and self-centeredness at a level which is crippling. And with this program, I can intervene with that. And I don't think I ever totally reduce it, but I reduce it to a point where it's no longer an issue and, and where I can recognize if it is. And like I say, make adjustments enough before anybody else knows but me. You know, and it is uh, like, I, I guess I just believe it. You know, I believe what's in the big book. I believe what's in the 12 and 12. I believe the steps are, are the way to stay sober and that staying sober allows me to have a lifestyle, which I could not, not only could not maintain, but could not appreciate without this being sober. You know, I believe going to enough meetings uh, in a week in order to, to keep myself grounded is super important. It just makes sense to me. It's been my life. You know, I mean, like I said, I've been sober for a little while, and that's been the one constant. Should I end it now or no? Okay, three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Okay, I'll say one more thing. So as a member of AA, I kind of am the gatekeeper for AA. And that my job is to make sure that meetings are available to as many people as possible. And that the, the window or the door which people come through is as wide as possible. And the way I do that is to not, is to, to try and be as welcoming as possible. To not be cliquish, to not be act, you know, too cool for school, to not... <laughs> ignore the newcomer, to not be rigidly adamant about the way I do this program and make sure everybody else knows, to, to not be sarcastic, to not complain, to all the things that the program helps me not do, and, and just to be as accepting and, and as open and as supportive as possible to everyone. Because this program is, for as far as I know, is the only solution for alcoholism. So if I participate in isolating or, or driving people away, I'm driving them away from the solution that, that I need, from the medicine that I need. It'd be like standing in front of the door at, at the uh, radiation clinic, the chemo clinic, and trying to velvet rope it, only let your friends in and maybe some, you know, cute women or whatever, and, you know, use some kind of criteria that I believe is important and only let those people in, and then the other people can just, that's too bad, they're out. So that's really important to me, is, and I try and do it a lot, is that this is, this is a program that saves people's lives and that we got to make sure that it's... And believe me, man, there's a bunch of assholes out there who want to get sober, and they interrupt meetings, and they do shit that pisses everyone off, and they deserve to get kicked out, and it doesn't matter, man. It just doesn't matter. This is a drug that cures alcoholism, and it's the only place you can get it. So they deserve a shot at getting sober. Oh, another thing is, I, I'm not going to read it, but I, when I got sober, it was the third edition of the big book, and I was going to read out of the story for that, but I'm not going to. It's trying to throw my weight around there. Okay, this is a little bit long, but please hang in there. AA is not a plan of recovery that can be finished or done with. It is a way of life, and the challenge contained in its principles is, a great, is great enough to keep any human being striving for as long as he lives. We do not, cannot outgrow this plan. As arrested alcoholics, we must have a program for living that allows for limitless expansion. Keeping one foot in front of the other is essential for maintaining our arrestment. Others may idle in a retrogressive groove without too much danger, but retrogression can spell death for us. However, this isn't as rough as it sounds. As we do become grateful for the necessity that makes us toe the line, and we find that we can be compensated for our consistent effort by the countless dividends we receive. A complete change takes place in our approach to life. Where we used to run from responsibility, we find ourselves accepting it with gratitude that we can be successfully shouldered. 
Instead of wanting to escape some perplexing problem, we experience the thrill of challenge in the opportunity it affords for yet another application of AA techniques, and we find ourselves tackling it with surprising vigor. The last 15 years of my life have been rich and meaningful. I have had my share of problems and heartaches and disappointments because that is life. But also I have known a great deal of joy and a peace that is the handmaiden of inner freedom. I have a wealth of friends and with the AA friends an unusual quality of fellowship. For to these people I am truly related, first through mutual pain and despair, and later through mutual objectives and newfound faith and hope. And as the years go by, working together, sharing our experiences with one another, and also sharing a mutual trust, understanding, and love, without strings, without obligation, we acquire the relationships that are unique and priceless. There is no more, no more aloneness than that awful ache so deep in the heart of every alcoholic that nothing before could ever reach it. That ache is gone and need never return again. Now there is a sense of belonging and of being wanted and needed and loved. In a return for the bottle and a hangover, we have been given the keys to the kingdom. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.